I remember when I was uh, accepted Jesus as a 17-year-old and, uh, and went from having fun at Christmas to also having the joy of Jesus inside of me at the same time. It was, it was wonderful. I trust that's everyone's experience here today. I know for some of you it might be a recent thing or, uh, or, or something that you haven't yet connected, but I trust that through today's message you're going to be touched. Uh, our message today is uh, talking about the hope that never disappoints. And uh, hope is a, a vital ingredient for human existence. Did you know that? Is, anyone here, is there anyone here today who doesn't want more hope? I mean, just let me know. You can head out the back if you want. Char will make you a coffee if you don't need any more hope. Uh, I think everyone who's a human being wants to have hope. Uh, and pretty much everyone, I think, would agree that a little bit more hope, or sometimes a lot more hope, uh, is, a, is a good thing to have. And that's, that's good news if you're feeling that way, because you're here at church firstly. Uh, and, but the other good news is that it's just a few days away from celebrating Christmas. And what that means is that it's an opportunity to connect with the hope that became a reality for our world at Christmas time when Jesus was born. The clue is there in that statement in that hope's just not an idea. It's not just a concept. I'm not going to say something clever this morning and you're going to think that's it, that's hope. It's not, that's not how it's going to happen. But hope is a person. Hope is God's Holy Spirit being in this place today. And hope came to us as a humanity through Jesus Christ. Uh, we celebrate Christmas and, and, of course, as a church, we say it's good. Uh, I also discovered this week that, uh, according to a s survey by the Salvation Army, 92% of Australians still say that Christmas is somewhat significant or, or stronger. They, they still acknowledge, which is a fantastic that there's still that in our community. I'm sure there's a lot of people who don't really understand what that might significance might be, but we know uh, that it's about Jesus. And, uh, but what we want to attack today, I really felt as I was preparing, certainly as I was preaching earlier this morning, uh, that uh, we want to emphasize the fact that the hope that we have in Jesus is not a hope that disappoints. And, and I really felt as I was preparing that for some of you, disappointment and despair are an issue right now today. That for some of you, uh, you need to hear a message of hope this morning. But not only that, we need to break in your life this morning a sense of disappointment and despair. That, that I really feel that God doesn't want anyone to leave this place this morning feeling disappointed. That no one here this morning should walk out of here being in despair. And I'm going to call it, now that we've got the D's going with uh, despondency, there's another one, despair, disappointment, they are each of the devil. We're going to label it this morning, folks, because it's a spiritual issue that you've got if you are living in disappointment and despair. It's not of God. It's not his plan for you in Jesus Christ and you needs to be broken over you today. Is anyone up for that? I mean, is there anyone here who said, no, thanks, I'd rather leave in disappointment. I mean, I'd rather walk out in despair. Can anyone really say that? I don't believe that's of God and it's certainly not his plan for you. Uh, Philip Yancey once wrote a book called Disappointment with God. Incredible title. I mean, how could you be in that place, you would wonder, and that's a fair question. He was asked, what's worse than disappointment with God? He said, easy, disappointment without God. Because God's in us and stands with us in our despair. When humanity didn't have an answer or a hope, he sent his very best, who is his son, to step into that place and be your saviour and redeemer. He sent his son to stand alongside you in your disappointment, in your despair, and to not only deal with it, but to transform it and dispatch it so that it's not your story anymore. And I really, I just feel God wants to touch hearts this morning. I feel that he doesn't want anyone to stay in that place this morning. He doesn't want anyone to be disappointed. Jesus is the hope that doesn't disappoint, that doesn't depart that doesn't leave us in despair. And we want to look this morning at us, the story of two people that I believe you're going to be able to identify with. They're not sort of key players in the Christmas story. We only hear about them in the Gospel of Luke. 
but the way that they were looking forward to what God was going to do in Jesus is, if you like, an example for us this morning. Because disappointment and despair have to do with looking backwards or looking down on where we are at this moment. But you can't have you can't be disappointed with the future. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. So if you're focused on the future, if you're focused on what God is going to do, I say disappointment and despair have got to leave. So we want to get everyone here today looking forward and looking at what God is about to do and is doing in Jesus Christ because that's what it means to live without disappointment and despair. Is everyone willing to sign on for that today? Just let me know if you're alive. Okay, that's good. Someone's breathing and um, that's great to hear. We're going to go with this. Okay, first person we're looking at is a guy called Simeon and we're going to read about him in Luke chapter 2, verse 25 to 20, 38. Uh, and then we're going to find out a little bit about who he was and the posture that he had in relation to hope uh, that never disappoints. It says in Luke chapter 2, Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all the nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him, and then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign of what will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There's a lot in that story, and I don't know if we'll have time to go through all of it, but what I want you to do is to hone in on Simeon, because there's some key things that we're told about him. Luke gives us detail for a reason, all right? It's there for a purpose, and Simeon, we need to look at where he was positioned. Firstly, the thing that I want you to know, and we've got a list of the things that Simeon was and did. The first thing I want you to know was he was waiting. He was waiting. Now you think, okay, I'm waiting. What does that mean? The point is that Simeon was looking forward, right? Simeon was waiting for something to occur. Now I know we're taught to be proactive and all of that. That's good. But what this means is, is that Simeon wasn't looking backwards, lamenting over what had happened in his life. Simeon wasn't despairing about things that hadn't turned out or, or that hadn't worked out. He wasn't getting stressed and anxious about where things were right now. Instead, he was waiting for a move of God. He was expecting that it was going to happen. He was expecting that God was going to break into not only his circumstances, but the circumstances of his people. And I want to encourage everyone here today that would be the lighting. <laughs> I'm trying to think of something clever spiritually to say, but thank you very much. I thought we'd lost power, but I could still hear myself, so it was all right. Praise the God. Thank you, Lord. Okay, Simeon was, was waiting. He was looking forward. And what I want to encourage each of you here today is to think about what are you waiting for? Now, you might be saying, well, I'm waiting for the turkey to cook or, you know, I'm waiting to get a Mercedes Benz. I don't know. Uh, I'm not talking about that stuff. But I want to know, is there a sense of expectancy in your heart? Is there a sense of, I am looking for a move of God in my life, in my church, in my whatever. You know, I'm believing that it's going to occur, that, that, that I'm going to be involved in a move of God. And if I can challenge you about anything this Christmas, especially heading into next year, I want to challenge your expectancy. I want to challenge what you are waiting for spiritually, what are you are believing for and what are you are looking forward to. Because if that is your posture, I say 
that despair and despondency and disappointment should be leaving you far behind. You, they, they should be bouncing off you because you are looking forward. Simeon was such a person and he was looking forward. Now, a couple of other things we know. It's mentioned twice that he, the Holy Spirit was on him, that he was moved by the Holy Spirit. And that's important because, as I said, hope is about a person. Hope is about God's presence with us. Hope's not, not just about how things turn out or what's happening in my life or, you know, it's going to get better. It's not that. It's about having the presence of God inside of us that constantly remind us and reassure us that he's with us. That, that he is moving in our hearts and in our lives. We also, also should notice about Simeon is that he was God-focused. It said that he praised God and that he was others-focused in that he shared uh, something about Jesus and about God with other people. He willingly spoke that out. But I also want you to notice, and this is the, the final thing I'm going to say about him, I want to challenge you in this area as well, is that Simeon had a promise from God. Simeon had something that he was hanging on to for the future. And, and I want to ask you today, especially followers of Jesus, people committed to him, what promise of God are you hanging on to? If someone asked you, the Bible says, be ready to give an answer for the hope that we have, what, what promise of God are you hanging on to? Now, some of you can say, can come up here now, you can rattle them off, no problems at all. This, this, this. In Simeon's case, it was a very specific thing that he, he had been given that the Messiah was going to come before he died. I mean, that's a powerful promise. Uh, I don't know if, anyway, I won't go, is someone here thinking Jesus is coming back before they're going to die? I don't know, it could happen, I don't know. But anyway, maybe let's keep it simpler. Now, if you're looking at me and saying, Pastor, I ain't got no promises, I don't know no promises, I ain't got any promise from God, I've got no prophetic word, no one's talked to me about the second coming, help me out. Well, I've got good news for you today, I know a book, I know a book where you can find a promise. There's a few in here and they all apply to people who say yes to Jesus and are filled with his Holy Spirit. And, and if you can't name a promise that you are hanging on to, let me say, this Christmas going into the new year, please get one. Just get one. Now, when I was a young fella, said yes to Jesus at 17, started work two months later. Uh, it was, a, it was a hectic time. I didn't know what to do, really. I, I, was, I knew I had to go to church. Church. Poor old Pastor Barry didn't even know he had to go to church when he became a Christian. The pastor had to tell him, gee, that's a great story. Um, but, and and I, I said, Lord, I, what do I do? And I really felt the Lord emphasize to me Matthew 6, 33, where he said, seek first uh, my kingdom and, and my righteousness and all these things will be added to you. That your priority should be me and my mission and ministry. And from there, the things that you need for life will be added to you. It's a wonderful picture of as you're going forward, I add this, says the Lord. I give you that, I add that. And that set my direction. That, that, that you know, helped me go forward. I didn't have to stress about, you know, where I would live, who I was going to marry. Praise God, he fixed that. With a beautiful woman who cooks and... If I wasn't married to Jude, I'd either be 50 kilograms or 500. But uh, you've heard me say that before. I'm getting closer to 50, Jude, which is great. It's uh, not going to happen in this lifetime. Um, but uh, so, and, and then when I went into a period many years later and was struggling a bit, I felt God speak to me through Philippians 1.6, which is being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will see it through to completion on the day of Christ Jesus. Look, if you're lacking a promise, you can have one of those if you want. I reckon Philippians 1.6 for some of you here this morning, you need to hear that today. God is not finished with you. God has not 
gone on strike with you. God is not absent from you, but what he's begun inside of you, he will see it through to completion on the day of Christ Jesus. Friends, they're just two out of probably 2,000 or more promises in the scripture. And I think some of you are not having a sufficient hope for the future because you're not clinging on to a promise as Simeon was about what is to come. And I think if you're going to give yourself an assignment, you need to make sure that's different for 2020, that you've got a promise for your life for that year that's changed that situation in some way. Is everyone okay with that? Are we going to be able to walk around church first week of next year and go up to each other and say, what's your promise? You want to try that on each other? All right, and let's see if you can have something to to roll out uh, and share with each other. Amen? Amen. Great. Another lady who is in this situation, this encounter which Joseph and Mary have with their baby Jesus, uh, was a woman called Anna, who we read about her story now. And she was in a very interesting situation herself. We're going to find out about that, but let's read about it in Luke chapter 2. It says, There also was a prophet Anna, the daughter of Penuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. Now, Luke gives us some interesting detail uh, about Anna, some of which I want to focus on. Firstly, she was a prophet. And I would have thought to have such a description about yourself is an amazing thing, really. We know that there is people in our midst who are very strong in prophetic ministry, and it's not often that we would say to someone that they're a prophet. It does happen occasionally. It's still a New Testament concept. But that sounds really dramatic. But the other one, I'm not sure if I actually want the other one listed in my biography, or not that I... She was very old, I mean, I mean, get this straight. She was not just old, she was very old. Very old. And it's interesting Luke would bother to tell us that. Like, what, what's, what's going on with this? Now, I don't know where you are in life at the moment. I don't know whether you consider yourself to be an old person. Maybe you consider yourself to be a very old person. Or not any of those. But I think in Anna's story, there's hope for us no matter where we are on that scale. Because this woman, if anyone ever had a reason for disappointment, I think Anna's standing near the close to the front of the queue. I'm just saying. What do you reckon? I mean, I'm just saying. Because we also find out that she was married, happily, I trust, for seven years, and then her husband dies. And then through whatever circumstances, she lives as a widow for the rest of her life. And just say she was married at 17, that's probably actually a bit old for what she might have been. She is married for 20, uh, till 24, uh, she's now 84, she's lived as a widow for 60 years. That's a long time. I thought my dear Nan did well to live as a widow for 39 years when her husband died of a heart attack at 48, my pop, when I was 10 months old. I thought that was pretty impressive. But 60, that's pretty impressive. But I want to challenge you and say, is Anna living like a disappointed person? No, she's not. Anna is not living like a disappointed person because her hope is focused on God. That it tells us that she never leaves the temple. I don't know if that meant she lived there or if she's just there a lot. You might feel like you never leave the church, and some of you do to keep the lights on. God bless you. That's good news. Uh, It says that she fasted and prayed, so there's a sense of devotion. She thanked God. So her focus is on what God is going to do. And I want to challenge you to notice that both of them were moved by the Spirit to recognize that God's salvation was a baby. Now, we know, because we get to see the end of the movie, that 
it was Jesus. Like, it was the Lord and Saviour of all the world. We're 2,000 years down the track. I mean, it turned out all right, don't you think? Two billion people maybe say yes to Jesus in one way or another. But then they've got this promise from God. You're going to see the salvation of God. What were they waiting for? What do you think you would have expected? An army riding into Jerusalem and destroying the Romans and what? And then the Holy Spirit says to them, it's this baby. I don't know. I reckon you would have need the eyes of the Spirit to see it, this baby is your salvation. I mean, I like babies, but the salvation of God? Wow. Anna was 84. I don't think she ever heard Jesus preach. She, you know, she was 114 by the time he started ministry. She took on faith that that was God's answer. And God's laying out for some of you today stuff that looks different from what the world might say is your hope. God is saying to you today that that hope is in Jesus. That uh, you might have been expecting or wanting something else as the answer for your despair or your disappointment or your despondency, but God's answer originally was a baby and today is the person we call Jesus. And I don't have any doubt that there are some people here today who have to say yes to Jesus, who have to say, yes, Lord, your hope is a person. Your hope is Jesus Christ. Your hope is his Holy Spirit alive on the inside of me. It's time to close the door to disappointment. It's, closed. it's time to move on from despair. It's time to leave despondency behind and start a new period of life living in hope that is Jesus Christ. To go into next year and to say, I ain't going to be a disappointed person. Yes, things look different from what they did last year. Uh, my family doesn't look the same. Uh, I didn't actually anticipate this or plan this, but because Jesus is here, I'm going to live as a person of hope. And some of you need to turn the corner today. You need to change your thinking right now. God is speaking to you through the power of his word and you need to leave church today in a different mindset. You've, you've got to do that because to do otherwise is to listen to a different voice in your life and it's not of God. It's not his plan for you. You need to understand that God is calling you to a different existence almost, a different life, and it's Jesus. That's his answer. Are you up for that today? Do you want that in your life today? Anna was a woman who didn't let the events of life overwhelm her, but instead was focused on what God was going to do and saw it in a child that we call Jesus. Friends, as we move towards the conclusion of the message, I want to bring some points home. Uh, firstly, to emphasise that God stands with us uh, in very real and tangible ways. We read in Matthew chapter 1, 22 and 23, that everything that took place with regard to the prophecies over Jesus and his birth took place to fulfil what the Lord had said through the prophet, that the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, excuse me, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now, God has not left us alone. God has not uh, removed himself from us, but has stood next to us as a human being in Jesus Christ. Yes, he is Lord and Saviour, but when it comes to making the point of who we should call him, we call him God with us. That's his name. He's standing with you right now. You're not alone. No matter how you're experiencing or think you're going to experience Christmas and next year, God is standing with you right now. Not only that, but we read in Colossians chapter 1, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. You're not being called on to just believe something. You're being called on to receive something as well, which is God's Holy Spirit in your heart. 
And when you've got God's Holy Spirit in your heart, He encourages you and He allows you to experience hope that's beyond description, that's beyond your circumstances, that beyond, that's beyond what's happened in your life. And I, and I want to encourage you today to let that hope build in your heart right now. To let that hope transform your heart right now. To be in a different space and a different place because of God's Holy Spirit. The role that hope plays in our life is crucially important. No human being can live without hope. No human being can get up in the morning and, and, and go about their daily life without some sense of hope that, that what they're doing is important or what they're doing is worthwhile or, or that, that, that things are going to progress, that, that God is going to be with them. Uh, and hope is so important that it's placed into what you might call a trinity of belief or experience, which we read about in relation to faith and love as well. It says in 1 Corinthians 13, And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But as we know in that scripture, the greatest of these is love. But what I want to emphasize to you there is that sometimes we find it easy to talk about love. Faith, we understand. But hope sometimes gets pushed to the side. We think, oh, well, we don't really need to worry about hope. You know, we just love people and have a bit of faith. It will be okay. But hope's actually an important ingredient in your outlook on life. And, and some of you, because of a lack of attention to hope, have let it slip. And then the enemy said, I'm just going to come in here and remind you about a few things. And I'm just going to start to chip away a little bit. And we'll just push hope out the door and we might push in while we're there a little bit of despair and a little bit of despondency and a little bit of, you know, disappointment. And all of a sudden we've walked from hope to hopeless. And all of a sudden we're not hopeful or filled with hope, but we're starting to drift and faith and love are starting to get a bit dull as well. And I really feel today the purpose of this message is to warm up and build up hope within every person in this place here today. And for some of you, it starts with saying yes to Jesus for the first time. Pastor Cass told us about a couple of people who made first-time commitments last week. Praise the Lord for that. You are now citizens of hope. You have a belief inside you that goes beyond what's happening in your life and in your world. But for those of us who've been around the place for a long time, we're coming to another Christmas and we're puttering along and we're wobbling a bit and we're a little bit sad or we're not sure and we're a bit doubtful. And we need to just stop for a minute and be refired in the hope that never disappoints, which is the presence of God in your life that began with Jesus' advent on earth. And we all need to clean out the cobwebs a bit today. We need to get a bit hopeful. We need to make sure that when we're connecting with people on Christmas Day or at this function or that, uh, that we're going in with a sense of hope. And we're not despairing over the salvation of the people that are around us. But instead, we're speaking a word of blessing over them. Even if it's Merry Christmas. I've been shopping this week and I look talking to young people, old people. And I just think, I'm going to say to you, Merry Christmas. Because out comes the word Christ over you. And I'm speaking a blessing over you. You don't know what I'm doing. You think I'm just being a bit old. But I'm going, Merry Christmas in Jesus' name. Receive the Spirit of God. I don't just have to do that. But oh, I'm going to, man, I'm going to preach. Because I'm saying the name of Christ our Saviour over you. Oh, I don't know what you're doing. So we need to get 
hope-filled this Christmas. We need to be understanding what's changed because Jesus has come. We need to be praying that the hope of Jesus will be seen by those around us. Pastor Bill's challenged us to think about who's coming to church with us this year. I've been challenged by that. You hang around for a long time and... You know, my dear uncle who passed away this year, he would often say yes to our invitations. I don't think he ever came to church other than when we invited him. Not long before he died, I was in Sydney for something else last year. I went and visited him. I I hired a car to go and see him. And, you know, my uncle Kev, he was the original Aussie bachelor. Lived (laughs) just like Anna, really, except he never married in all of his 77 years. And we were there this day and I said, Kev, you know, he knew I was a pastor, obviously, um, and I, I just didn't know how to tackle it. I was, I'm thinking, there's my uncle, you know. And I said, Kev, we had a bit of a chat. I said, would you say Jesus is your Lord and Saviour? I went with that one. I mean, it's not, he's not a guy for a long explanation about. And he looked at me and he said, yes. Now, he, ain't, he now got baptised. He didn't go to church every week. That's what he said. So I said, can I pray for you? And I prayed for him. It was a while ago now, but uh, he left us in March, the last surviving family, of, a member of my mum's family. The rouses of Wyala in this life are no more. So, you know, sometimes it's, it's you've got to keep it simple. <laughs> sometimes you've just got to, you know, ask people for something. Give me something. Give me something to hang on to. Give me something to pray for. Cause something to come out of their mouth. I invited my brother, going off target a little bit, Bill, but I'm gonna, I'll am gonna, i get back to it. My brother came to the men's breakfast, Tim. Yesterday we're having birthday dinner and he said to me, that was a really good breakfast. And I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm thinking, mate, when people say, I could tell the spirit's at work in there and he's trying to say somehow Something happened at that breakfast. That breakfast was different from another breakfast. (laughs) Because it was at church and my brother and my dad were there and Johan Boda's talking about faith and and he liked the cooking too. He he mentioned that. I said, yeah, man, we've got two pretty good people on the cooking. Don't you worry about that. But there's the spirits at work in our family and friends and, and, and they're trying to grab it but they, they had not have the word sometimes. Sometimes all they got is yes. Sometimes all they got is it was a good breakfast. But they just reach out and give them something back. Grab hold of a hand and bring them along. Just, just something to hold on to. I'm going to go with one more family story before we pray. Five years ago, my family was having its 10-year gathering which we do as a family. We've done it in Perth three times. <laughs> the first one we missed because Emily was born on December 22. Happy birthday, Em. Uh, she's 25 today. Wow. Quarter of a century of Emily. <laughs> <laughs> oh, praise the Lord. <laughs> praise the Lord. And um, my auntie, so we're, we're all gathering at Uncle Ellen's house before we head off to Christmas lunch, the whole Bland clan. And she comes up to me the day before and she says, Now, um, Dave, uh, uh, we want you to say a few words before we go to lunch. Oh, okay. Just say something about Christmas. And then we're going to take up an offering. (laughs) This is what she said, for for some sort of, I don't know, kids or something. All right. So I'm, I'm this, I got 24 hours notice. I'm thinking, well, okay, this will be good. What's, what, what, what am I going to go with to the Blands? And I'm thinking very carefully and I'm, I'm thinking, okay, well, we can, well, I can give you a nice Christmas sermon about the hope that never disappoints. But I, I, you're talking to people that m- many of them may not have been to church for decades. So I thought, okay, let's keep it simple. And you know what came out? Cass, you'll like this given the title. 
I, th- I felt the really strong thing to say. I said to them, because of what God did at Christmas time, there's always a reason for hope because Jesus is now with us as our Lord and Saviour. That's what I gave them. I just said, because of what happened at Christmas, there's always reason for hope. That, that Jesus is the hope of all the world. My uncle and auntie came up to me afterwards. They have a grandchild, my second cousin, who has, I think it's pronounced mitochondrial disease. He doesn't develop, no strength, can't talk. He's now 12. Yeah, very tough for my cousin. They were very touched by that because they need to hang on to something for their grandson. They need to believe that in the world and their existence that there's something beyond what they see to cling on to. And we preach Jesus Christ. We preach Jesus as Lord and Saviour of all the world. We say he is the light that has come into the world for the Gentiles, which is all of us, for people that are far away, that was once us. And I feel today that God wants all of you to grasp onto that hope, to cling on to it. I want to finish with this scripture and then we're going to pray. Isaiah chapter 49 verse 23. The Lord speaking. He says, then you'll know that I'm Lord. We could paraphrase and say, when you see Jesus, you'll know that he's the Lord. When you see this baby, you'll know that he's the Lord. Those who hope in me will not be disappointed. No one who places their faith and their trust in Jesus Christ is disappointed. No one who comes to him and says, I choose you over despair. I choose you over disappointment. I choose you over despondency. This Christmas, you are my Lord and Saviour. I will not believe a lie about you or anything else. No one who comes to him is disappointed or lives in despair. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the words that have been spoken over us today. We thank you for the truth and the reality that you saw us struggling. You knew that as people of this earth, we needed something beyond ourselves. And so you sent nothing less than your son, your absolute very best. And Lord, we declare today again, it is is Jesus, Lord and Saviour of all the world, the hope that was to come into the world, the light that shines upon us. And Father, I'm praying today for every single person in this place. I have no doubt you want to speak to everyone. For people that have been believers for a long time, you're just polishing up their hope. You're refiring their hope. You're getting their thinking straightened out and their heart sure about the hope that they have in you because we need it as much as we need faith and love we need to know that you are there and that you are with us so Lord I pray a blessing and I pray hearts filled with hope this morning Lord I'm praying especially as well for people that haven't yet said yes to you that that they would see clearly now that true hope is only found in Jesus. That they would say, whether it's today, whether it's this Christmas, they would say, that's my hope now. That's the hope I'm going to believe and receive. That's the hope I want inside of me. I take that hope instead of despondency and despair and disappointment. And that they make that their future. That they hang on to that promise and they look forward. Lord, finally, I want to pray for people really struggling with disappointment. Maybe things have changed for them this Christmas. Maybe it's the first Christmas without a loved one or or something's changed that just makes it different. Lord, I pray that they would not be in despair or disappointment or despondency this Christmas, but instead they'd be alive with hope that comes from knowing that you are the Lord and Saviour of all the world, I pray in your matchless name. Amen. 
Amen. Folks, we've got some time this morning to really do some work in this area of despondency and despair. And I want to open up the front here this morning for a time of prayer. After the 8.30 service, I had a couple of people come up to me. One mother in particular who uh, felt her her 43-year-old son was battling with a sense of disappointment. He was reaching that stage where he thought that too much had gone wrong in his life and 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 she he she was worried for him and we prayed for him so I just want to encourage you now whether it's someone you know or it's you yourself whatever your situation is let's deal with despair let's let's nail it right now let's cast it out I'm saying let's have a spiritual let's just get rid of that and let's walk into Christmas 2019 in hope I'm just going to ask you to get to your feet. I'm going to ask our prayer ministry team to get ready. As we sing and as we worship, I really want to encourage you. If you're in a situation of despondency or you know someone who is, come forward now. Let's pray for you. Let's gather around you. Let's lay hands on you. And let's speak the hope that is found in Jesus' name. Let's speak that over you right now. Thank you, team, as you lead us. Folks, you come forward. We're going to pray and we're going to believe that the hope of Jesus is going to be deep in your heart. You come now, folks. Prayer ministry team, please come straight away. Let's begin praying. Thanks, Tanya. Just before we start praying, folks, I really feel to emphasise again, if you're here and you haven't yet said yes to Jesus, if, if that you wouldn't call yourself a Christian, I feel there's an offer for you this morning to experience your first Christmas as a believer in Christ. And, and we want to pray for you right now. If that's you, you come forward. You tell the people that co- the person that comes up to you, I'm saying yes to Jesus for the first time. And we're going to pray and believe that you're going to experience Christmas, not just as, as, a, as a feast, not just, uh, you know, as a fun time, but as a Christmas of hope with Jesus Christ. If that's you or you have any other prayer need, come forward now and we'll pray for you straight away.